can change the world. There's an organization that has been working on alleviating, maybe even eliminating poverty from around the world for quite some time is the Grameen Foundation, and David Stevens from Grameen is with us. David, welcome. Thank you. So let's let's talk about um, where Grameen has evolved. You started out with the cell phone and selling shares of a cell phone, basically, or cell phone use, and you've moved a little bit. Well, <clears throat> uh, about 12 years ago, uh, Grameen Foundation USA, you know there's over 100 Grameen organizations that Eunice has founded, but Alex Counts uh, founded, I think it was 15 years ago, Grameen Foundation that was primarily focused on uh, helping to finance and solve uh, microcredit. But uh, about 12 and a half, 13 years ago, Eunice suggested that uh, that one of the ways that you solve poverty is to replicate uh, solutions and use technology to replicate those solutions. And uh, so Alex took the, uh, took the challenge and uh, we created a organization in Seattle called Grameen Technology Center, which is now run by David Edelstein. And the whole idea of that was to look at existing solutions uh, that were working and replicate. The term scale is not used uh, at Grameen. We don't like that term. Uh, but replication is, is something that's pretty significant. Mm -hmm. um, so in 2003, uh, you, you probably know about the Grameen phone in Bangladesh. Uh, Grameen Foundation replicated the first uh, Grameen phone system in Uganda. <clears throat> now, uh, remember everything we need to do, we do is self-sustainable. And so we invested some in partnership with MTN and um, we thought it would take about three and a half years to become self-sustainable. But we had to, they already were cell phone towers up, so we didn't have the investment. Our, our purpose was to loan money to women to become phone ladies in Uganda while things were pretty, still pretty tough in the <laughs> mm -hmm. over there. But in eight months, we had 9,000 phone ladies, and it became wildly profitable. Uh, <clears throat> it was interesting because we'd even see people using phone minutes for currency over there so the, really? and like while everybody didn't have phones back then that, that's 10 years ago uh, everybody would have a little you know their little chip and they were moving money around uh, on their chips well it really wasn't money but it was phone minutes um, it became so successful that a few years ago we actually had to exit that and sell our interest back to MTN because it was making too much money for a 501c3 <laughs> hmm. so that was really the one of the first uh, things that we really uh, pushed forward and got involved in. Mm -hmm. From a replication yeah. standpoint. <clears throat> and what the evolution is, is that today we're using phones and building phones, uh, phone applications in what we call the App Lab in partnership with a, a bunch of wonderful organization like the Gates Foundation. Uh, <clears throat> and one of my favorite to talk about is uh, creating uh, what we call CKWs or Community Knowledge Workers. And the one I like to talk about um, is in Ghana we've created the mobile midwife program. Mobile midwife. And uh, what's interesting about it is <clears throat> we connect the midwives by cell phone back to the Ghanan clinic and then the midwife goes around and finds all the pregnant ladies and starts collecting data uh, then takes that data and texts it back and then then what happens is the center then is able to send voicemail messages or text messages to the women and then they start identifying things like ectopic and early pregnancy but the biggest issue that I'm most excited about is they get the women to the hospital uh, when there's when there's problems earlier on <clears throat> and we're not seeing the death rate uh, a lot of women die on the way to the sure. uh, hospital because they all wait too long so, and, and that's as a result of the, of the replicated work through mobile mm. midwives. Yes. Now, that's, that's a project, and when, when that becomes completely successful, then we can replicate that to other places. And instead of saying, we're going to scale this, you know, we replicate it mm. based on the local. And a key word here is adoption, getting it adopted. The second CKW that I think you'd probably be most interested in is in going on in Uganda right now where we have, I think, close to 8,000 community knowledge workers that are very focused on health care. I'm sorry, on, on uh, agriculture. Mm. And so they're connected and they have certain information that they're able to give to the local farmers. And so they've directly impacted about 175,000 
local farmers now providing information to them and we just had a uh, study come out that said um, that the farmers that use the CKWs versus the ones that don't use it are having a hundred and seventy percent increase in their production. Wow that, that's fantastic and, <clears throat> and is it if it's local then it's a local solution is that is that essentially it's it? exactly right and so even though it's replicated from somewhere else it's um, it still is based on whatever local solution it possibly can have. I think that's critical. Um, the um, experience, what, what Eunice likes to talk about is when he first became involved in, in social stuff, he was a professor of, of uh, economics yeah. in Bangladesh and people were all dying around him. And uh, he realized, he says, here I was teaching economics, but I was looking out the window and thousands, hundreds of thousands of people were literally dying. And he said, I realized that education teaches from the bird's eye view. And if we're going to solve a problem, we have to look at it from the worm's eye view. And uh, of course, I said to him, I said, well, aren't worms blind? And he says, that's exactly my point, that we have to look at it from the, from the lowest possible point. Hmm. So when we talk about the base of the pyramid, we even have to include refugee camps, which I think are at the basement of the pyramid. Yeah. I want to tell you about an experience that, that I recently had that ties in with microfinance. And um, mm. actually, as, as someone who, is, who comes from business, I'm a little concerned about it because I've always been a big fan of microfinance. Where I was, I was in a West African country, and what I saw was what appeared to be way too many microfinance companies. And if microfinance is being as successful as it is, then shouldn't the interest rates come down? I think you have to look at the analogy of what's happened here in the United States with credit cards. If anything, the interest rates have gone up, mm -hmm. and that's because um, the credit card companies really don't care about the individual. And what's happening is that kind of mentality is creeping into the microcredit side mm -hmm. of the business. Sure looks that way. Now. It's interesting when you go back to uh, Eunice's model of microcredit. Uh, you you don't just go get a loan. They're not going to push a loan on you just like, hey, here's a $500 credit card. Uh, there, there's a long uh, step to becoming a microcredit borrower. And the first thing in Bangladesh you have to do is you have to agree to not give or receive a dowry. And and that's, that's a critical thing in that area. Mm -hmm. The other thing that <clears throat> is is also true is that you have to agree to educate your kids and and that's checked on every week because they're small loans but every week you make a small payment over a year and if you pay off your loan at the end of the year you get another loan and it could be a little bigger but um, my favorite one that he talks about and I like to tease my US banker friends about this is that he noticed when when pe really poor people are um, <clears throat> just surviving, they don't use latrines. And uh, so one of the rules of microcredit in Bangladesh is that you've got to dig a latrine. Well, they go, oh, we're too poor, we, you know, we're, we're tired, we can't dig a latrine. And uh, so he says, basically, no, if you, if you don't dig a latrine, uh, we can't loan you the money. So they dig a latrine, but then the problem was actually using it. So part of the banker's job when he goes out every week is to check the latrines to see if they're being used or not. <laughs> now that's a job. Well, I always, I always say, if you guys think you got it hard in the U.S., <laughs> go over and work in Bangladesh as a banker for a while. But my point is, if you really study what microfinance is, it's about changing lives. It's about um, talking about not only self-reliance and understanding self-reliance, but also uh, self-esteem. Mm -hmm. And what happens is when money comes into the picture, about solving the problem, no, nobody considers that stuff. But I can tell you right now in Bangladesh, 100% of the borrowers of Grameen Bank, are their children are, are literate, whereas only 50% literacy exists currently in Bangladesh. Now we've started Grameen, in, uh, Grameen Bank here in the US. We started, we've got Queens, Brooklyn, uh, all over the country now they're starting and yet interestingly enough it's a little larger loan it's 1500 we, d we don't make people dig latrines there uh, but interestingly enough it's the highest repayment rate of all the microfinance organizations but it's all about the process and it's not just about handing out money and the problem we have now 
in microfinance is the same problem we've got here, which is once you look like you're credit worthy, every single credit card company is going to try and give you a credit card. And the mm -hmm. next thing you know, you're bankrupt. The only difference is you don't really file bankruptcy in an emerging nation. You just uh, get beat up. You get your roof stolen or taken back, repossessed. And that's nothing that ever happens with Grameen. But that's a whole different model. And I think mm -hmm. people that are thinking about microfinance sincerely need to understand the difference between what the Grameen model is and what a lot of these other plate people are doing. But I think the microcredit summit through results, uh, people need to look at that and see how they're bringing people together and teaching some of those same philosophies, uh, whether or not you have, you don't have to be Grameen to do this. There's 175,000 borrowers now. Yeah. And we'll be sure to get that up on the screen uh, about the microfinance summit. Um, let's talk about something else, broadband. Um, I mean, broadband's an <coughs> absolute uh, essential uh, aspect of American business, but you're talking about it for the world. Well, when we finished the uh, Uganda project and we realized how much communication, it's interesting what we saw is how fast communication brought peace. That was more than anything else, the, the peace, because people are interested in doing commerce. They're now having economic opportunity. They can communicate. Uh, if there were problems, they could call, and there's, you know, there's a security issue that, that happens. So the challenge was, uh, how do you provide broadband? And Eunice's challenge was, how do you provide broadband for under a dollar a month? And that Sounds like a challenge, yes. Yes, and we've been working on it now for about five years. Mm -hmm. And we're now getting ready to do the first, we'd actually done the first implementation in Mexico, uh, more about adoption and what people do with it and all that. But we're working in partnership with uh, some, some wonderful UN agencies, including the uh, UNHCR. And the idea is, um, if you've heard about M-Pesa, uh, M-Pesa is an organization in Uganda that was founded by uh, uh, Safaricom mm -hmm. in order to transfer money. Well, nobody thought that would be a big deal, but all of a sudden uh, the money transfer thing at M-Pesa slash Safaricom is 20% of the GDP of Kenya. Uh, over a billion dollars a month in transactions go on, and um, th there's, and these are, you know, pennies a transaction. Yeah. So they're actually making more money on the transaction side of it than they are on their phone business. So the idea is <coughs> you realize what communication and connectivity does for commerce, and yeah. of course commerce then creates other opportunities. So we figured out a way to use old junk satellites, the ones, the ones that are no longer in use up in the sky, and use that kind of a connection to connect post offices around the world. Hmm. Now, Who owns those things? Uh, various what they call fleet flyers, but, but they put them up there and they move after a while. So you'd have to have a, an antenna that's kind of moving around to, to track those. But they're less than one-tenth the cost of, a, of the current kind of satellites. So we can reduce the cost by 90% of satellite coverage and then we have some really cool... Wow, that's fantastic. I would never <clears throat> have thought about that. Well, we have, now we have um, some other technology. Bottom line is that we're, we're, our cost is going to be around 30 cents a user per month for oh. satellites. So it's essentially Grameen is moving into being a technology mm. company for the poor? I don't think so. I think it's a solutions provider to replicate uh, replicate, solu replicate successful things. And it doesn't matter where it is. I mean, it's, if you look at what Danone Yogurt has done uh, with the uh, Danone Grameen mm -hmm. project, I'm very involved in that. And um, that's really interesting because the, the whole idea of social impact um, using, uh, not using philanthropy, but using social investment. Uh, so in 2006, Grameen and uh, Danone created a yogurt plant in Bangladesh. But the interesting thing about it, it wasn't about profit, it wasn't about anything else except the children in Bangladesh are getting 60% of their nutrients today. So the solution is, or the, the problem is, how do we get these kids to get 100% of their nutrients. But we have to make it affordable. So the idea was a seven euro cents per cup of yogurt, and if you get two a week, you get 100% of your nutrients. So there's a lot of things that are involved in solving that problem, but one of the major issues is that you've got to produce, distribute, and consume the yogurt in 48 hours because there's no cooling. Yeah. But in 2011, 
uh, independent nutritionists came in and found that 25% uh, of the kids were getting or are now getting 100% of their nutrients for two cups of yogurt a week. Now, of course, that created such a stir in the community that they had to double the size of the plant. Um, but the other issue that was really fun about that was that how do you distribute that? So uh, they went to the beggar women and they said, look, you keep begging, that's, that's kind of fine, but, but here, here's 48 cups of yogurt. And it, you can sell them, you can eat them, you can do anything you want, but if you sell them and keep enough money back, you can buy 48 more. So now there are 6,000 distributors and 2,000 of them are former beggar women. Really? Yeah. Wow, that's fantastic. So those are the kind of things where you, now, now here's the issue. We want to replicate it in 400 sites in India. So now that's calling for, if it's a million pounds or, or a million euros a, a site, how do you, how do you raise for 400 yeah. million on a social <laughs> impact investment? So now we're working on uh, a term I call so, uh, royalty-based investment, and that's for another time. Okay. <clears throat> Something that's not for another time, but it's for all time, is a poverty museum. Uh, that's an interesting point. Um, Eunice and I were flying to uh, Haiti and uh, we're sitting on the plane and I said, you know, I've been with you and working with you for almost 12 years and I realize now that when you say something, it's really gonna happen. And uh, so I believe you when you say there's gonna be a poverty museum. Now this is before all of this stuff that's going on right now, they're saying, oh, we can end poverty. Well, he's been saying it for, you know, at least 20 years. And I said, so where are you gonna put this poverty museum? And he says, well, Bangladesh. And I said, well, then only Bengalis will see it. And he says, oh, it'll be good for tourism. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, I, we, we, we laughed and discussed a little more about that. And, and uh, we realized that the Poverty Museum needs to be virtual. And, and the idea is, is if you create a virtual Poverty Museum where people can tell their stories, um, maybe other people will look at it. So then we came up with the idea that when do we start this poverty museum? Do we wait until 2030 or whenever when there's no more poverty? And the conclusion is no. And it's not a Eunice museum and it's, it's, it's a poverty museum. You know, mm -hmm. Eunice is a piece of it. Yeah. But there are so many people that are working on ending poverty and there are so many people that are still in poverty that if we can use the, the term poverty museum, create it virtually and start aggregating where all of these things are, then instead of scaling the end of poverty, because there's not one solution. We can replicate the end of poverty. And what happens is people are telling their stories, people are telling how to do it, people are looking at the stories of how one person came out of poverty, another person says, I can do that, but I can do it a little better, they're playing it forward. But then one day we wake up, and the only thing, place you'll find poverty is this museum. Now, <clears throat> think about how incredulous your kids would be if you took them to a museum and told them this is what poverty used to look like. I mean, it's almost like if you went to a war museum and said, and you take your kids to that, and they say, how, can, how could the human race have allowed that to happen? And I hope that that stays there for a long time because we don't want to repeat this. We're going to end poverty, we're going to put it in a museum, and we don't want to repeat it. So we want a place where we can go back and look at what happened and how we got out of it. With that, David, we'll let that be the last word. Thank you very much for being you with bet. us. Thank you. It's been David Stevens of Grameen Foundation. Take care. Rainmaker believes we can change the world. One life, one heart, one soul, one mind at a time. Rainmaker believes we can change the world.